I'm Melissa O'Sullivan with the Danube Institute, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the whole Danube team to hear Mary Harrington this evening, writer and author from the UK, and we're just delighted to have her here. And I should say, in addition to being a writer and an author, she's a wife and a mother. So let's welcome Mary. Joining Mary will be our own Rod Dreyer, Director of Network Projects here at the Danube Institute. And he has just come in from out of town. So he's here with dusting the uh, airport off of him. So thank you very much, Rod, for being here as well. Now, a bit about Mary. Mary Harrington is a writer and self-styled self reactionary feminist. That was a term she came up with, and it seems to have stuck. Her work has been published in First Things, American Affairs, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, The Spectator, The New Statesman, The London Times, and The Mail on Sunday, amongst many others. She's a contributing editor at Unheard, where she writes a weekly column. Her book, Feminism Against Progress, was published in 2023 with Forum Press. And I wanted to read you a bit from a review about her book. Feminism Against Progress is a stark warning against a dystopian future in which poor women, poor women, meaning economically, become little more than convenient sources of body parts to be harvested and wombs to be rented by the rich. Progress, quote unquote, no longer benefits the majority of women, and only a feminism that is skeptical of it can truly defend their interest in the 21st century. I'm so grateful she's here. She's got an important message for women and men. Thank you. Mary Rod. Mary, uh, welcome to Budapest. We've been trying to make this happen for a while. I'm glad you finally, finally got here. Uh, you know, I, I was trying to explain to uh, a friend of mine here who doesn't know your work, who you are, and he said, uh, isn't she a conservative? I said, well, no, not really, but he sees feminism against progress, and it's sort of discombobulates his expectations. So before we get started about the book itself, how would you situate yourself politically and why? Well, oh, this is on, good. <laughs> um, the Colombian aphorist Nicolas Gomez Davila said, I'm, I may be paraphrasing, but more or less, he, or one of his favorite aphorisms of mine is that he says the, the reactionary only becomes a conservative in ages in which there's something to be conserved. Um, I call myself a reactionary, partly as a byproduct of a very long argument I had with a friend via, all via Twitter DM um, about whether or not post-liberal actually means anything. Um, he said, you should, you should call yourself a reactionary, Mary, or a reactionary. I'm like, what, who, what, who are you? Where did you come from? Well, you just slid into my DMs to, to have, pick a fight with me about post-liberal. Um, so, but, but we had this argument, and eventually I conceded that Yes, I, I, I decided he, he, he'd made a persuasive case for reactionary over post-liberal as just having a bit more content or, or, or a bit less, or being a bit less empty. Um, but I, I, never, I never really thought of myself as a conservative because I don't really think there's anything much left to conserve. Um, and I don't see how it's possible to be a conservative when we're sort of walking through the rubble and, you know, there's a Louis Kahn's chair here and, you know, half of a building there. Um, but actually the project is more one of rebuilding. Um, and if you're going to be rebuilding, then the question is rebuilding what? Um, and and on, on what basis and in order to what values um, and I, and to me that that's the that's the meaningful question that's the important and the exciting question now is you know what what do we what do we try and build you know in the in the rubble of of our relations with one another and our our assumptions about what matters and and to whom um, and there's a state of almost complete liquidity uh, liquefaction I think is the word I'm looking for that we're in now. Sorry, that's probably a very evasive answer to your question. No, no, I, I, think, it's, I think it's true, because I find myself in, sometimes in the same spaces. Uh, there's a, a very useful concept that a Marxist uh, sociologist, Sigmund Bauman, came up with called liquid modernity. And um, 
and I think it's, it, I'm actually glad I had that in mind when I was reading Feminism Against Progress, because uh, you're talking about the world that Bauman defined. Uh, and for the audience, Bauman said that in modern times, what, what makes modernity modernity is the rate of change. And it has sped up so fast in the 20th century and now the 21st century that before any new change of life, uh, of, of habits, of institutions can become firm, it changes again. So we approach a place where what was once solid is now liquid. And of course this concept comes from Karl Marx, uh, the Communist Manifesto, all that is solid melts into air. And that's actually true. It may be one thing Marx got right. But so what Mary's talking about is we're trying to figure out what can we do to live a meaningful human life in a time and a place when everything is totally fluid. Now, you are a heretic. You, you uh, said that you lost your faith in what you call progress theology. What is progress theology and how did you lose your faith in it? So I didn't, I've, I haven't spent a great deal of the book arg defining or setting out to critique what I call progress theology. I've, I've sort of, but, but I've opened the book with a sort of baseline description of, of what, I, what I mean by that. And that is, I mean, it, probably the best way I could describe it would be as it, it's a sort of bastardized Christianity. It's a kind of a, a byblow of Christianity, which takes the, the belief that we're going from somewhere to somewhere, and that the, the somewhere that we're going to is hopefully going to be better than the somewhere we're coming from. But it takes all of the transcendence out of it. So it all just happens in, in, in the here and now. There's no, there's no death, judgment, heaven, or hell. There's no afterlife. There's no life beyond death or before it. Um, there's, there's, only, there's only the material plane. And, and within that material plane, there's, there's a sort of generalized belief that going forwards is always by definition better than going backwards. Um, that, there's, that there's somewhere we're going to, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, you know, understood in usually very materialistic terms. When you push people on, you know, so, so where, how, what, what does progress actually mean? You know, when you, when you push people, they'll say, well, you know, this moral change or that moral change, but actually what it always comes down to is material, an improved standard of living. Comfort. That's, yeah, comfort. You know, physical comfort, washing machines, or um, more more spending money, or more you know bigger houses, or I don't know, like and or better uh, better medical care. I mean, on, honestly, despite being a progress atheist, I, I would be loath to give up modern dentistry. I will not lie about that. And you prize my washing machine from my cold dead hands. You know, we all we all have our commitments, but 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 the but uh, uh, the point I the, the starting point for my book was was not really it wasn't so much washing machines or or dentistry um as as the as the structure of thought the, as the structure of belief that's around all of these technologies which says that we're going forwards we're not going backwards and yet somehow the the pro and, and this is not this is not a material thing this is a moral thing um and that um, somehow this is always threatened by the forces of reaction, but we must go on going forward and we mustn't, we, we, we mustn't ever allow again a social transformation to be, to be lost again that has been gained. And the social transformations themselves, which are understood as good, are always about more freedom. So more, more freedom from physical work or more freedom from the givens of our biology or more freedom from one another, frankly. Yeah, it, it liberates the choosing individual. Yeah. Right, exactly, and, and yeah, just so. And, and my, my starting point for the book was that this, to, to see this in moral terms in this way is not, it's not that, like progress is not a fact. Progress is, is it, progress is a belief, it's not a fact. You know, there's, a, because, I mean, this is something, this, my loss of faith in progress happened, I suppose, over several years. Um, it just it just stopped being obvious to me that things were getting, like the totality of human well-being was getting better. I just started thinking, well, is this actually true? I mean, you know, yes, we, we, have, we, have fewer, we, we have fewer wars than maybe during the 30 Years War. Like there's, you might say there's less conflict, but, I mean, but also we have the atom bomb. You know, we don't, we, we, we have less routine animal cruelty, but we have factory farming. You know, we have, we have more material comfort, but we also have un, unimaginable ecological de degradation and, you know, the mass extinction of species. You know, are we really making progress? And like, on what metric? And I sat down and I, I sat down and I thought it through and I thought, well, the only way you can argue the case for progress is by defining the terms of what you constitute progress and leaving out a whole load of other stuff, which, which might be a counter argument, which is, which, I mean, that's what the lawyers call begging the question, isn't it? 
you know, where you assume yeah. the truth of what you set out to prove, and so you've just rigged the game in your favor. And I'm thinking, well, no, this is just nonsense. This is, this is just a belief. This is a, this is a theology. It's a metaphysics. And you know, it's, it's not just a metaphysics of the left. I, I found that in my past writing, whenever you began to critique from the right free market economics, whether this has really been beneficial for, for human... It's the same theology. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. But, but they get so angry because mm -hmm. they want to define progress as something that only comes from the left and is bad for that reason. But when you begin to ask people on my side, the right, to question certain dogmas that have, have uh, uh, the, myth the myth of progress built into it, they find that very, very hard to take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the first article I ever wrote for Unheard, it was an attack on the idea of economic growth from the right, on the basis that there's a zero-sum contest between uh, economic growth and a great many of the things which conservatives claim to want to conserve, such as family life, or um, the, 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 the stewardship of the natural world, or religious faith or well I mean the, the list goes on and I'm sure you're familiar you, it's it's fairly clear to you as well and all of these things if you ask a, a modern quote-unquote conservative you know if, if it's a zero-sum contest between family life and economic growth which are you going to choose and without fail if you push them on it in like off the record they will all choose growth yeah and, and it's the it's the elites on both the left and the right we can get into this later in the discussion but you really point out that the system we have now is built, uh, feminism as being part of it, is built to serve the interest and the convenience of wealthy people mm -hmm. uh, on the left and the right, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and in a sense, the two, the two sides, the left and the right, the, the liquefying social forces which come from the left and the liquefying economic forces which come nominally from the right, um, are two, I mean, I've, if to, to use a crude metaphor, they're two cheeks of the same backside. And, it's, <laughs> and they're marching in lockstep because they have to. And they're both asses. <laughs> It's the same as. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, tell me what it was, what event in your life caused you to, series, to, to break with the myth of progress? Uh, the first thing that radicalized me was, uh, was my own fault. Um, I mean, I think the, the, big, the big implosion happened for me in the late, the year of the great crash in the late 2000s. Um, I, it's 2008, a very, yeah, 2008 yeah. yeah. It's a long, complicated story, but I founded a startup with friends, and we genuinely believed that we could simultaneously get very rich and also save, make the world a better place. You know, we was, it was sort of proto-woke capital, I guess, or yeah, very third way. But, I mean, you, you, I don't, for, for those of you who, who were kids in the, in, in the 2000s, the, the third way was when England, people in England genuinely believed that, that big business was going to be a delivery mechanism for social good. Lol, haha, <laughs> as they say, <laughs> lol. Um, but we, and I mean, what we have the, the sort of bastard child we have of that now is woke capital. But back then, people really believed it. People thought that the, that big business could be reordered to social enterprise and to making the world a better place. And and I guess I we we sort of bought into that and we thought, well, you know, maybe we can, you know, as, as Thatcher's children. I was born the year Margaret Thatcher came to power. Um, I thought, well, you know, if if we do actually just live in a world where where corporates are the the main the main fabric of everything, then, then maybe that's all there is, and maybe we just need to find a way of, of, of wrestling, wrestling the, that energy back towards something a bit more idealistic. So we had a go. You know, we tried, we founded a web startup, and we, we tried to make, make the world a better place by disrupting education in ways that we thought would be beneficial. Um, and and it, it all went wrong, partly because the great crash happened, but also partly because I was just too nuts. To, to be a very kind of easy person to work with. And it was my fault, and I got kicked out, and it was devastating, to be honest. I mean, it was, I lost my social circle, and I lost my friends, and I lost my purpose in life, I thought. Um, I, lost, I lost literally, it, yeah, I, I lost everything. Um, I had to move house. Um, yeah, it was awful. It was horrible. Um, and it was, it was just, if you go through an experience like that where just your whole world falls apart, then you, you end up, and, and it's your own fault. <laughs> Um, you, you know, I, I just ended up ask, asking myself a lot of questions about what I really believed, um, about who I really was. Um, I, I, I left London. I, I retrained for a new career. Um, by the time I came out of that sort of long, dark tea time of the soul, it was, you know, seven years had gone by and I was married and I was living in the countryside and I had a kid. And that was, so I, I guess the, the, it started with losing what I, as I thought, everything in 2008. Let me think, when... So, yeah, 2008 to 2016. Um, yeah, so roughly a seven-year arc. 
And then, and, and that was the year that Brexit happened and Donald Trump happened and also the year I had a baby. So that was, that was an, another transformative year, both in the world in general, um, but also in, in my, own, my own universe. Um, and, and in the meantime, I, I, spent, I did a lot of reading and a lot of writing and a lot of rethinking. And I suppose I, I suppose I got to the critique of double liberalism just about two and a half years ahead of everybody else. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, there's a whole there's a whole discourse, and you know, you've you've written you've written um, eloquently on on some of those paradoxes, and you know, a great many other very many other fine thinkers have, have done pioneering work on that, such as Patrick Deneen. Um And I was I I, I happened to I, I sort of found my way into that that whole current, and and brought with it the experience the absolutely transformative experience of having just had a baby and had to rethink everything which I believed up to that point again. Yeah. About about what feminism was for, and that that was a striking thing for me in the book is how uh, having the baby is was the the key event in this transformation. I think. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? Uh, and I'll preface it by saying that I was in Paris last night visiting a friend. He's a new father, and he was just going on and on, mooning over the new child, about how it's changed his life. And I told him, yeah, you know, when, when uh, my wife and I were getting ready to have our first child, my, my sister, who already had kids, called me in New York where we were living and said, just two weeks before the baby was born, and said, you and Julie are about to lose most of your freedom. And I know you know that. Oh, yeah, we know that. She said, what you don't know and what you can't know until you have that baby in your arms is what you will gain. Nobody who has been on the other side, you know, who has not had that experience can really understand it. But trust me, it's going to be amazing. And I said, well, I will trust you. And she was completely right. That happened to you. Yeah, it, it happened to me. And I guess if you're, if you're the woman gestating the child, it starts, it starts earlier. Um, because the moment you know you're pregnant, if, it, if, if it's a want, well, whether it's a wanted child or not, but if, the moment you know you're pregnant, you're not just one person anymore. And that's a very brain-melting thing experience for somebody who's, who's grown up having imbibed all of the sort of liberal individualist ideas about what it means to be a person, which is to say bodily autonomy and freedom from, and you know, my, my, my freedom is measured in the, the number of obligations I don't have, in a sense. And, and then suddenly you find yourself in a position where actually in, inside, it's a literally visceral experience. You know, there is another person in your viscera. Um, who is who you already love more than it's possible to imagine loving somebody. I mean, I, I lost I lost a child before before I had my daughter. I lost a baby at nine weeks, I think, and it was it was the mo the most horrible thing that's ever happened to me, hands down. Um, did that and that was that was to you know I, I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a baby at twenty weeks or to you know to lose a child who's born. Um, it, it doesn't even bear thinking about. Um, but that, that, that experience of being more than just one person, which, which begins before the child's able to survive outside your body, um, is, is complete, it's completely brain-melting. And that, I suppose that started me wondering about the basic premises of the feminism, which I'd always internalized, which said that I'm, I'm, a, woman, I'm a person to the extent that I'm, I'm free from interdependence with other, other beings and free from the calls that dependent beings make on me. You know, and, and to have to have dependents make be able to make entitled to make calls on me is is a state of unfreedom and is a state of oppression, and and then I, I and here I am, you know, with, you know, being kicked kicked in the back from the inside, thinking, okay. sorry, <laughs> yeah, there, there I am, sort of being being kicked in the internal organs from the inside and thinking, well, this is this sucks, but also this is great, you know, because this is this is the most important, this is the this is this matters so much, and and. And I, and I couldn't make that add up with, with the feminism that I'd, I'd internalized up to that point. And I was thinking, well, how did we get to a point where the movement which claims to speak for women has, has a blind spot that's this big, that's, you know, that's the size of mothers, all mothers? Uh, and, I, and then I start, I, you know, and then my daughter was born, and I, after, after the first, after a year, um, the, the other mothers who were, you know, in all the mummy groups and the baby classes started going back to work. Um, and I... And, and my husband asked me, you know, do you want to go? Do you want to go back to work? And I thought about it, and I thought, well, I sucked at everything I did professionally up to this point. I was absolutely, I was borderline unemployable. I was just terrible, <laughs> just rubbish at everything. Um, and there was, and there was nothing I really wanted to do. 
professionally more than be be there with my daughter. There was, the, you know, and the prospect of being away from her for 12 hours a day, you know, to go and I don't know, you know, shunt pieces of paper around a desk. Um, why would I want to do that? Yeah, and and at that point again, I had another one of those sort of light bulb moments, and I thought. You know, I'm, I'm watching the, I'm watching my sort of mummy group peers go back to work and often be, feel very ambivalent about it. You know, they're missing their babies and they're wishing they could be at home longer or they're having to do more hours than they would like to do. Or, you know, they're all, they all seem really cut up by this and really torn on the whole thing. And, and I, I, I have a choice. You know, I was incredibly fortunate. We were able to afford for me to stay home if I wanted to. And I was like, this is, I always believed that this was, that, that to be a stay-at-home mum was to be a failure or, or to be oppressed, you know, to have been held back in some way. And here I, and, and, and then again, it was one of those complete sort of um, through the looking glass moments where I realized that having the choice, um, made, it wasn't, wasn't oppression, it was privilege. And I thought, okay, okay, like, so, so, so being, being a mother means that radical individ like liberal individualism doesn't work. Um, being a stay at having the having the option to be a stay at home mum is a privilege. Um, and I don't believe in progress anymore. But I still think I'm a feminist. Does this even work? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. And I, 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 I think I, I must have sat with that question for a few years. Is it even possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress? Or if you can see mothers? Or if, you, or if you want to argue the case for mothers, or if you're a bit skeptical about liberal individualism as being compatible with motherhood at all, does that even work anymore? And I guess, I guess the, the short answer is yes, but it depends what you mean by feminism. <laughs> um, and the longer answer is the book. Well, what do you mean by feminism? In what sense are you a feminist today? I, I would say from reading the book that you're a feminist because you're asking, what, what are the conditions that make it possible for uh, feminine nature to express itself most fully? Is that fair or? Uh... I don't know that I'd put it quite like that. Um, but uh, the, the, way I, the way I came to make sense of it was just unpicking, I, I started by, by trying to unpick the women's movement from, from this idea of sort of moral, a, a, a moral arc from, less, from more bad to less bad like taking off the progress goggles and trying to see the women's movement as a social phenomenon mm. and, and thinking, well, you know, if this isn't, if this isn't, if this isn't by definition progress, what is it? What are we actually looking at? Is there another way that we could see this where it would make more sense that isn't about, you know, the arc, the arc of the moral universe? And, and I realized actually, yeah, um, that it's, the women's movement to me makes more sense if you see it not as the arc of the moral universe, but as an effect of industrialization. I guess there's my sort of old kind of leftist training. No, but, um, but, but talk about that. What, what okay. do you mean? So, so by that I mean um, in in the Middle Ages, you know, plenty plenty wrong with the Middle Ages, to be clear, um, or plenty plenty that I wouldn't necessarily want for myself in the Middle Ages. But one thing that one thing that women in the Middle Ages didn't have was balancing work, balancing work and family, because everybody worked. Um, outside very aristocratic settings, the men and women both worked, but, they, but the economic life of, of a community was completely different, such that work wasn't, for most people, work wasn't something that happened outside the home. Work was just what, work was the business of, of subsistence, usually in agrarian communities. So men and women both worked, um, and, and men's work and women's work were different, but everybody, everybody was productive, and the basic unit of subsistence wasn't individuals, as it is now, you know, where everyone has a tax code, and everyone's usually taxed as an individual. Um, the basic unit of, of the basic economic and political unit was the household, um, which might be bigger or smaller, and in an agrarian, you know, might involve, it might include extended family or, you know, domestic uh, workers or whatever. Um, and, and in, that, in that context, women would work just as much as men. You know, but, and broadly speaking, if it was a farmhouse, it might be the men would produce raw materials, so for example, you know, grain or meat or um, flax or something, and the women, would, the women would process it. And everybody was working, and, you, you, and it was... Ivan, Ivan Illich has a beautiful way of describing it, where he, he characterizes the, the, the sexed division of labor in, in pre-modern societies as being like the right hand and the left hand working together. You don't, you don't see one, one or the other hand as superior to the other necessarily. And they do different things, but, and, they, and they work very naturally and spontaneously in relation to one another, but they are also distinct. Um, so so that, that, that's broadly, very crudely, the, the pre-modern setup. Men and women both work. The basic unit of, of economic life is the household. Um, 
Under those circumstances for women, there's no, there's no conflict between work and family um, because work is something that you do around, you know, it, it's, it, for, you're looking after children is, is, is just part, part of what you do while you're making textiles or churning butter or whatever. Um, and the, and the, the example I've given in the book, which I think captures this very beautifully, is textile making. Um, which has been, uh, for something like 30 or 40,000 years, has always been women's work. Uh, women have always woven. Uh, women have always made textiles for the family. And there are, the, uh, I found a, a great historian who writes about this and who, who argues that it's, it's, it's always made sense for women to be the ones making textiles because you can, you, if it's a loom you're working on at home, you can raise it off the floor so the baby doesn't get tangled up in it. Um, it's, it's, it's interruptible, so if you have to go and get the toddler out, you know, stop the toddler killing themselves in the fire, or <laughs> you can. I mean, I don't, if, you, if you've got kids, you'll, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, you, you, they, they, they need constant low-grade managing, otherwise, so they don't, like, um, you know, walk, in, walk into the fire or uh, do, something, do something crazy. Um, but it's not, you, but you can be doing other things while you're doing that. Um, and, so, and so women's work has tended to be the stuff that you can do while keeping an eye on toddlers. And there's lots of that in an agrarian, in, a, in, a, on, in, in subsistence agrarian life. Um, and so that's broadly how, how things break down. And in that, there's no conflict between work and family. Um, but, but with industrialization, the, it was actually, for, it was women's work that drained away into, into factories before men's work did. Um, so, so textile making went into factories. Um, you know, food production increasingly, the processing of raw materials into food increasingly was something which was centralized and industrialized. Um, and and as, as the, the productive activities that had once been done by women in a productive household drained away from those households, the care of children can't be industrialized in the same way. You know, it's, you, you, you might be able to send weaving into a factory, but you can't send, well, not until more recently anyway, you can't send childcare into a factory. Well, no, not, as, not as easily anyway. And so for those women who were, in, who were in the relatively fortunate position of being able to... Um, of, of being able to afford to still stay at home. Um, th th those women, for the most part, opted to still, to still stay at home and care for children. But in fact, they lost economic agency and they lost, um, they, 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 they lost productive agency and, and to a significant extent, I think, power in the home in the context of doing that. And really, the, the women's movement, as which comes into being, it, it, it just, women, the feminism doesn't really exist. Um, before industrialization, um, and it's only it's only with the the inception of the women's the, the in, with, with the disappearance of work from the home that women are suddenly faced with a whole load of new conflicts. Whether you're a working class woman who's got to find somebody to look after their babies while you work in the factory all day, or you're a you're a bourgeois woman whose half half of whose possible act, activities have disappeared, and and furthermore you're also completely economically dependent on a wage earning husband, and and also you're subject to the legal system which is left over from the days of of productive households, under which there was a male head of the household who had all of the legal power. And, and so suddenly you're faced with a, with a new material and economic situation um, and legal situation as well, which, which leaves you radically vulnerable. And then in the, in, the, in the context of that, the 19th century women's movement in England sort of bifurcated and one half of it set out to make the case for bourgeois domesticity as still being valuable in its own right. Now, a lot of, a lot of second wave feminists don't read the cult of the... The, the, female, the female defenders of bourgeois domesticity as feminists, I do. Um, I think that because there was, a pl there was a huge amount of writing by women in the 19th century on the, the, the importance of the mother in the home, the, you know, the value of, of the, uh, women's, women's contribution to educating young children, and you know, a host of other sort of household management and domesticity, bourgeois domesticity related subjects. There were magazines after magazines after magazines which were devoted to this. Um, and to me, it, I, I see that as a straightforwardly feminist voice that's saying half of, half of what, what women used to do in the home has disappeared, but what we do still do in the home still matters. You know, the care of children and the creation of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a, a, a space of respite from this sort of new competitive industrial world of capitalism and competition, is the, this, this matters, this the is important. Behaving in a heartless yeah, world. Yeah, right, exactly. Exactly, and, and under, the, under new circumstances, that was, that, was one, that was one half of women's characteristic response to the new to industrialization. And the other half was to say, well, no, actually, this isn't good enough. 
This isn't enough because, you know, the, the, the bourgeois domesticity is all very well if you have a good husband. But what if you have a husband who beats you or a husband who drinks all the way, drinks the family wage or a husband who, who just abandons you? You know, you, you, you have, no, you, you have no, no political say. You, you can't get a job. Um, your husband can take your children away at the drop of a hat. Um, you're screwed. Um, so, so what were, and those women said, well, actually, we need to enter the market on the same terms as men. And so, and this, and so this, was, this was the other pole of 19th century feminism, which I've called the feminism of freedom. And this was women like Harriet Taylor Mill, uh, the, she of, who apparently wrote half of John Stuart Mill's work, a very, <laughs> very, very important uh, early liberal. Um, and and on, in, in America, I'm trying to think of, is it Stanton? Uh, Elizabeth Cady yeah, Stanton. Yeah, that's right, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Yeah, but so, so the, and, and Early Alice, feminist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Alice Paul, the, suffrag the suffragist. Um, so so, the, so these, uh, most of these figures were, but Alice Paul in particular, I think she was one of the originators of the Equal Rights Amendment that you fortunately still don't have. Um, <laughs> And who's, uh, who was committed to the idea that there should be legal, legal, absolute legal parity between the sexes all the way down. And the idea for the feminists of freedom was that the best way to pursue women's interests was for, for there to be no difference in the way men and women are treated. And for the feminists of care, it was about defending the home and defending the family and defending women in the context of our network of relationships, even under the diminished conditions of bourgeois domesticity. Now this, and so this was, to me, this was feminism proper. There's this back and forth, and it's a very rich, and very fractious and very, very contextual, uh, depending on where you are, um, back and forth between care and freedom from roughly the, the sort of late 18th century up to the middle of the 20th century. Um, at, at which point, my, my argument is that the feminists of freedom won. And they did so with another tech transition, which was the arrival of contraception and then inevitably in, in behind contraception of abortion. So how did the sexual revolution uh, put the feminist revolution on, on a rocket ship? <laughs> well, it didn't. The, sec the sexual revolution ended feminism. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the sexual revolution killed feminism. But I, I think that wouldn't the narrative, the received narrative be that uh, when women had contraception, they could own their own fertility, and that freed them up to, uh, to live their own lives as they chose to do yes, it? Yes, Rod, because the winners write the history books. So... <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> so, so what happened in the 1960s? Yeah, if, you, if you're seeing this, there's a sort of back and forth between the feminism of care and the feminism of freedom. The, the, femi the, the freedom feminists are still with us, although I think of them more as, as cyborg feminists now. Um, but they, they, the, the feminism of freedom defeated the feminism of care in the 1960s because at that point a new technology appeared which made it seem much more possible than it ever had done before to completely get rid of the, the sex distinctions between men and women. So, so really, the, I mean, the feminism of care had always, you know, to, to, to put it crude, you know, to say there are ways in which women are just irreducibly different. You know, we breastfeed, we give birth, you know, we have, we, we, we want to be with our babies. You know, the, these things, we can't just say that treat it, we, we can't just treat men and women the same across the board because sometimes women want to be treated differently. That's, that's a sort of a, broadly a sort of an embodied sex realist feminism of care perspective. And the feminists of freedom say, well, you know, for, for, forget all of that. Actually, what we need is, is equal rights in the workplace. Um, and, and I'm being very reductive here. Um, but the, but what, the, what the sexual revolution did, which, which is properly speaking, it's not the sexual revolution, it's the transhumanist revolution. Um, but the, the arrival of legal, legal birth control gave men and women both the impression that we could act as if there are no, like the, sink, the, the most distinctive sex difference between men and women could just be done away with. Um, if, I, if, if I can have sex like a man, then it, it somehow comes to seem much more believable that I can, I can live like a man in every other respect. Um, particularly as manual labor is starting to drain away with the, with the rise of the knowledge economy and, every, and more and more more and more men and women are just doing desk jobs and I mean at the end of the day you know if I'm if I'm a lawyer or something it doesn't really matter what sex I am not in theory I mean there's no there's no made there's no significant cognitive differences not not significant enough cognitive differences on average between men and women to say definitively women shouldn't do these jobs um, the, the, on, the, the only major obstacle is women's, dis, women's different reproductive cycles. And if you can use medication or, or surgery to control those, I mean, there are, no, there are for, for, at least for knowledge workers, no meaningful dis, dis, dis differences left between the sexes. And so, and at that point, the, fem, the feminists of freedom were like, right, this is it, you know, let's go. You know, 
for finally, we, we have a technology which will give us what we want. And the feminists of care who'd said, no, actually, sex still matters, they just sort of were, were sidelined. And then finally, well, the, 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 there's a... Uh, I'm trying to think how to... There's a period from approximately the beginning of the 1960s up to the early 1970s where this was all very much in flux. The, the, and the, the arrival of the, the period, if you like, between the arrival of birth control and the legalization of abortion, where, um, where, 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 this, where, where this battle was really played out. And, and, and the, I, th I think it, it's, very difficult to, it's very difficult to overstate how, how radically uh, the arrival of birth control changed pretty much everything. I, mean, I think the, this year's Nobel Prize, one of this year's Nobel Prize winners in economics, um, her, her work focuses on how indispensable the oral contraceptives were to, to women's entry into pretty much every domain of public life you care to name since. Um, but another effect that, 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 birth, that oral contraceptives had was to completely transform sexual mores. And they did that so, 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 so completely and so quickly um, that whereas, whereas campaigners for birth control had assumed that, 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 that with, this, with this technology, um, unplanned pregnancies would go down, um, in fact, the opposite happened. And this, this was a completely counterintuitive development. You know, the early campaigners for birth control, such as Margaret Sanger, um, had always believed that you know, the, the, best, the, best way, the, be, the best way to ensure there were no abortions or that there were no unplanned pregnancies was, what, was to give people access to birth control because then ov obviously you know, people, are not, people, are, pe people will restrain themselves and their sexual behavior won't particularly change. Um, and then it, they'll just have this extra, extra means of, of ensuring that, nothing, that, that, people, that you only get pregnant when you want to. Um, but, that, but that's not what happened. What actually happened was that was the sexual revolution. Suddenly people could have sex, you know, pretty, pretty indiscriminately with, you know, suddenly it was possible to have what seemed like relatively safe casual sex, relatively deep risk-free casual sex. And as a consequence of that, there were just so many more people having casual sex um, that, the, that the number of unplanned pregnancies went up, not down. And if you, but, but then you're in the 1960s, the early 1960s, and abortion is still illegal. So everybody's having all of this sex and all, there's all these unplanned pregnancies happening, but abortion's still illegal. And so you've got this, you, then you've got the skyrocketing number of women who are have take, getting illegal abortions. They're dying, you know, they're, they're women, are, women are dying in pools of blood in hotel rooms, and you know, we're getting hideous infections or being rendered infertile. And it's not a, it's not a tenable situation. But nobody knows how to put the genie of the, of the pill back in the bottle, and nobody really wants to because they're having a great time. <laughs> And so, and so then it, it creates this, this inexorable ratchet towards the legalization of abortion, which becomes the feminist issue. And what, what feminists now, what, what the, the, modern, the, the, the modern feminist narrative doesn't like to acknowledge is that actually a great many of the early feminists were, were anti-abortion. Um, you know, it's the, the idea of an anti-abortion feminist now is, it just seems surreal and inconceivable. But there are a huge number of, a huge number of, of, of women who considered themselves part of the feminist movement in the 60s and 70s who, who, who felt very strongly um, that abortion was, was morally equivalent to infanticide. Pretty much all of the 19th century feminists you know, viewed abortion as indistinguishable from infanticide. Um, and it's only, it's only since, the, since the legalization of abortion and actually particularly in the United States, the, you know, it's, it's like the, the uptake of that cause as a central plank of the National Organization for Women I mean, sorry, I don't want to go down the historical rabbit hole about now. Um, but, the, but, but, but it's only, it's only since, since the legalization of abortion and everything which has followed from that and the economic order which, has, which we've ended up with downstream of that, that it's come to seem so unthinkable that, the women, that, that a feminist could also question the morality or the legality or even the feminist credentials of, of that procedure. How do we get Mary from the... the sexual revolution to the point today where you have women uh, prostituting themselves and calling it sex work or doing only fans, doing you know, bespoke pornography for subscribers. And that is described and that is uh, fixed, fit into the narrative as progress, as a feminist act. It seems, wouldn't that shock even the, er, the Betty Friedan and the early or the 1960s feminist. Absolutely, I think it would. But it, it follows logically from, if, if you accept in principle the idea that my, 
my bodily autonomy is the thing which matters most, and, my, and that my bodily autonomy is so significant and is so important that I can secure it even at the, even at the ex expense of a life that's dependent on my own body. If, if you accept that basic premise, with that, which is sort of you know, the central plank, if you like, of cyborg feminism, then the, 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 the central metaphysical piece that, you, that everything else follows from is I own myself. And, and I think, you, you, uh, I dare say everybody here has come across you know, that, that or, a, or a similar sentiment in a feminist context. I own myself. You know, I, I, I control my own body, I own myself. But, and, and logically, if I own something, I can do what I want with it. Yeah, there's no intrinsic meaning to, to the body. I mean, if I, if I own my own body, why shouldn't I buy and sell it? Yeah. Well, 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 the, the, only, the only drag, well, once you accept in principle that the central premise of cyber feminism is, is self-ownership, then there's no, there's, there, it, there are no very robust arguments against commodifying yourself. Right. And, 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 and if, it's, if, it's, if, if it's acceptable, if it's, if it's empowering to own yourself, then it's empowering to commodify yourself if you want to. Right. And therefore, it must logically be feminist. There's no, there's no way around it. The, the, the only way to, 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 uh, to make a feminist argument against self-commodification is to start from a completely different set of premises about what, what, what women's interests are. Now, uh, I, I'm watching the clock here. I want to make sure that our audience has a chance to ask you questions. But uh, what, what you're we're leading to is what you call meat Lego Gnosticism. <laughs> and what this is, I want you to explain that term, but, um, but it's at the heart of what you're talking about, which is not... Feminism as what men and women, uh, the relationships between men and women or the relationships of, of women in society, but at the bottom of that, the, the metaphysical substrate, it, it seems to me, of contemporary feminism. So uh, help us understand what you mean by meet Lego Gnosticism. Um, I'll see if I can back up a little bit. And I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll get to meet Lego, which I, I, I think is, is fairly self-explanatory. What I what it might what I mean by meat Lego is this belief that a great many people have that our body parts are just you know pieces that can be removed or added or reconfigured you know as as people according to desire, and and I I draw I draw parallels between that belief and some and and, and the the distaste for uh, the material world um, that that comes through in the early Gnostic heresies, but we're, we're, how do, how do we get to meet how do, how do we get to that belief system i mean again i think it, it emerges logically out of a belief that cell phone that that biomedically assisted self ownership is the basic like un, underpinning for personhood which comes out of the the 1960s and 1970s the you know, feminist inflected turn into the transhuman era which comes first with birth control and then and then with legal abortion um, and and this is um, to be clear, what I'm not saying is that it's, it's feminism's fault that we're now, fem, feminism's, gen, gender ideology is feminism's fault. Gender ideology is, it, it's a much bigger thing than feminism. But it, it's very difficult, and, and, and I'm also not saying that we have to abolish all feminism in order to, in order to get rid of gender ideology. But it's very difficult, I mean, you can draw a straight line from, from the birth control pill through to the, the, the cyborg turn in feminism, which is to say, you know, the, the belief that my personhood is fundamentally, is basically, con is, is deep, is contingent on technology. Yeah, you know, and and turning human bodies into machines, if right. you say that the human body is nothing but a biological uh, uh, body, body parts are, are analogous to parts on, of machines, then everything else follows. I mean, if you accept the premise that, that I can only exist as a person to the extent that I rely on birth control to flatten my reproductive cycle and abortion as a backstop, should I find myself unpersoned by being the host to a baby? If, if, that's, if you accept that basic premise, then why should you not extend it to all people? Why should, you, why should you not extend the freedom to use technologies to enhance your personal freedom beyond, beyond the, the field of women's fertility? Why should you not extend, like if I, can use, if I can take an artificial hormone which controls my reproductive cycle in the interests of personal freedom, why should a man not take an artificial hormone that, that gives him the, synth the synthetic appearance of a woman in the interests of personal freedom? At the end of the day, it's a difference of degree rather than kind. Yeah. 
So how is it that, um, th that in the UK, the feminists have had uh, some success in pushing back against gender ideology, but in the US, most feminists are still very much on side of transgenderism you know, trans, trans rights or women's rights, that sort of thing. We, we'd be here. I've, funnily enough, I just wrote an essay about this. Um, so I, well, we, we could be here all night unpicking the, the nuts and bolts of it because my, my theory is that it's, a, it's actually that, that's less, well, there, there are two sides. On the English side, I think the, the NHS, like the, our healthcare funding model has a, has a, has a role to yeah, play in that. National Health Service. Yeah, the, the, the National Health Service, which... Which, which takes, by def, you know, because it's taxpayer funded, it takes a more, a more conservative approach to what, to what it's willing to fund than, than, than an insurance-based model in the United States, where really it's just the Wild West. And mm -hmm. well, whatever you can persuade an insurer to fund, they'll, they'll, they'll give it a go. Um, but it's not just that. I think you know, the, Britain also has a history of trade unionism, and a lot of the English um, gender-critical campaigners come out of trade unionism. We have a lively radical feminist subculture. We also have Mumsnet. So that's, that's on the British What's side. What's Mumsnet? It's an online forum for mothers, which, is, <laughs> which has been, it's been a, a, a funnel for radicalizing sex realist feminists into feminist activism for, you know, at least since 2005. Because that, though, I mean, the TERF started mobilizing on Mumsnet long before. TERF's that. trans exclusive trans trans radical well, feminists. Well, yeah. The, the gender critical feminists began mobilizing on Mumsnet long before they, they started talking anywhere else. So just just having a space, having a space for, for women to talk and say, no, this is ridiculous, was significant. But I think uh, on the American side, um, the, the history of feminism in America is very difficult to separate from the National Organization for Women now, um, which was founded in the 1970s. The, I, I believe, no, it was late 1960s, between, between the legalization of birth control and, and, and Roe v. Wade, well, now came into being. Um, and over the course of its history, its most influential history in the 70s and 80s, it shackled itself to the Equal Rights Amendment and made that the number one cause, even to the point of, of expelling or you know, having feminists drift away from what had been quite a pluralistic um, organization, a pluralistic movement, because they, they didn't think that was the most important issue. Um, and, and, now, and because now was so focused on the Equal Rights Amendment, that meant that they were focused on the feminism of sameness, which is the feminism of freedom, which is ultimately you know, structurally reliant on these technologies in order to flatten the still very real sex differences. So, so it, the, and, and so the entire matrix of institutional, political, and funding power um, that, that, that now, that's now well established over several decades in America around, around feminist activism is... Is, is, total, is, is both ideologically and politically and economically inextricable from a commitment to the technologies which also underpin gender ideology. And, and, and it's incredibly hard to find any space around that. And then and, and the, ER, the ERA campaign kind of caused the culture war. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the origin story for the, for the American culture war. Yeah, Phyllis Schlafly, the right. conservative uh, uh, who pushed back against that, a woman who became hugely popular on the right, including with a lot of conservative women, mm -hmm. by pushing back uh, as a woman yes. against uh, yeah, feminism. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, all, uh, a, great, a great many of the conservative campaigning structures and, and the, the alliances between, between the evangelicals and the social conservatives and, and other forces also coalesced in the course of resisting the Equal Rights Amendment. Right. And so, so the, uh, a lot of the institutional structures in America, which are... The, which are now fighting the culture war just back and forth like a Punch and Judy show, um, came out of the argument over the Equal Rights Amendment. And one of the consequences of that is if you, if you, spout, if you, if you emit heresy, um, if, then the, the, there's a very sort of Schmittian logic to the culture war, which says that if you, if you express sympathy with the other side's position on any point whatsoever, then you're just expelled into the outer darkness. Yeah. And that means that it's, it's impossible to be both left-wing and gender critical in the context of American feminism, whereas it was a much more ambiguous um, matter in the, United, in the UK because we just don't have that history of culture war and we don't have that punch of duty. So that's probably more information than you need, no, but no, that's no, but my it's, analysis. It's important because I, I think that one key, key factor is you don't have a religious right that's at all in the US and certainly not one that, I mean, in, in the UK, and certainly not one that's politically active as we do in America. And so uh, to hear you talk about uh, the what birth control did, uh, the, the negative aspects of birth control, if you said that in the US, you would instantly be coded as some sort of traditionalist Catholic. 
you know, but you're not a Catholic, and I'm not, I don't know that you're even a Christian. You, you, so you came to your points of view from a completely different premises. That's right. I, a, a reviewer in Church Times in the UK accused me of having scaled the north face of the Vatican without pythons, which I thought was a funny way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, you know, I've sort of, I've accidentally reverse engineered a whole load of Catholic social teaching without actually being a Roman Catholic. Um, and, you know, there are, and there are, there are some points where I, I, I do take a more secular perspective. You know, for, for example, I don't take an absolutist position on abortion. And I really went back and forth on that because if I, would, if I were to follow the logic of my arguments all the way through, I ought to be saying we should ban it tomorrow. But as a feminist, I can't, like, I can't in good faith do that because I think, well, you know, were, were, were abortion access just to be withdrawn tomorrow in the context of the way social mores have changed and all of the other things which, all, all the other economic and, and social incentives and assumptions that people and habits that people have um, in in the in, in the that, that have come downstream of its legalization, the, those those behaviours wouldn't change overnight, and the cost the the cost in suffering would be unimaginable. And so I found myself concluding that the the the, the, quest, the question as a feminist that I think we should be asking is um, what what would it take to create a world where abortion was no longer necessary? And, and, and surely there's some way that those of us who are ambivalently pro-choice and those of us who are ambivalently pro-life could work together on trying to realize some of those things. And uh, maybe, maybe my position will change again in the future, but that's where I am on it now. Yeah. So uh, before we go to audience questions, let's uh, quickly talk about your you, you've had the diagnosis, let's talk about the prescription, what you think can and should be done. Um, the first thing you say that people should do to rebuild something out of the ruins of, of, what, of contemporary culture is to get married. But you say that there's no going back to a pre-1950s or, or 1950s pre-sexual revolution idea of marriage. Can you unpack that for us? Um, well, I... My, my case for marriage is, is more, it's even more doomerish than that, to be honest. I mean, I look, at, I look at the way the world is going and I don't even know if there'll be any welfare state uh, in existence by the time my daughter's an adult. And under those, you know, it, and the advice I'll be giving her is that if you want to be a mother, you know, you shouldn't be relying, you know, don't, don't assume that, there's a, that, that, the, that the state is gonna be there to pick you up if you, if, if you end up being a single mother. You know, life is hard enough as it is for single mothers, even with some measure of state support in place. Don't assume that, that any of that is still gonna be there by the time you're an adult. Um, my advice to you is choose wisely um, when it comes to a life partner and choose somebody who's gonna show up for you year after year after year. Prioritize loyalty. Um, because if you want to be a mother, you know, the, 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 the statistics are, are are robust enough as, as things stand that women flourish as mothers to the extent that they're well supported. And the, and the first line of support for any mother has got to be your, your, your spouse, your partner, your husband. Um, you know, your, your, and, and your, the, the, the father of your children is more likely to stick around if you're married. Um, he's more likely to be involved with the children if you're married. Um, and, is, and, and, and there are certain, people have done great work on, on, on why, why it's obviously better for children. For, for both parents to be present and to remain married. I mean, all, all of this, you know, the, I can give you a chapter and verse on the sociology of it, but from a women's point, like it's, it's straightforwardly in women's interests to be prioritizing finding a good man who, who'll stick with you. Because I think the, the, world is, the world is growing more frightening and more unstable and more economically unpredictable. You know, we seem to be in a kind of rolling poly crisis. And the advice I'd give to any woman who's considering having children is make sure, make sure you do it with somebody who's going to stick around and who's got your back. Um, because I don't, I don't, I don't see, I don't see right. the, the years of peak progress coming back. Yeah, you say in the book that uh, we need to surrender the, uh, the modern conception that marriage is primarily about personal fulfillment and expression, Absolutely. and instead go back to uh, thinking of marriage as a means to create conditions to have a meaningful life. Yeah, it's, it's an enabling condition for flourishing in all kinds of other ways. Um, I think we, we have got to, a, we, we got to a point just through material abundance and relative peace 
to of believing of of of, of seeing relationships as as a kind of vector for vector for self fulfillment, like like a sort of consumer product that you buy that you think is like like a new handbag that you think that you buy that you think is going to make you happy, and and to assume that it would be it's fine to discard that if if at any point the the product doesn't live up to expectations or it's not delivering self actualization anymore, um, which is which is fine if you're very if you're very very rich or if you or if you you're confident that you're going to be able to rely on the state to pick up the pieces and and to keep body and soul together for you i mean it sucks for the kids but no, nobody nobody really bothers to talk about that um but but if if the, if we're past peak progress as i believe um then I, I don't think we can i don't think we can rely on that paradigm anymore and, and i think we need to we, we need to abandon the romantic paradigm of man marriage and to think of it in very much more pragmatic terms um and if and, you know, some people say, well, this sounds a bit bleak and a bit dreary. And no, actually not. You know, so committing to one person to build a life together um, for in perpetuity is an incredibly romantic thing to do. It's just that the day-to-day the day -day grind is, is, is hard work. Um, but, it, it, yeah, it's a, if, you, if, you see a, if you see your partnership as an, the enabling condition for everything else to flourish, and particularly as the enabling condition for, for enabling children to flourish. Um, to, to, to me, that's, that, that's not less romantic, but more. It's just, it, it, it's just a different way of looking at it. Now, your second prescription was, and the title of the, the chapter part is, let men be, which is to say, let men be men. What do you mean by that? The argument I made in that chapter is that one of the undercounted costs of um, the feminism of, of, of the, the feminist pursuit of sameness and the, and the flattening of sex difference um, has been the loss of male social spaces, and and I think I think that's a very very underpriced and very grave cost. Um, in that, you know, people people fret about the epidemic of male loneliness, and you know, you get well-meaning feminists saying, "Oh, you know, if only men would go to therapy or you know talk about their feelings to one another, um, then maybe they wouldn't all be miserable." And I was thinking, no, no, you, you've got it completely wrong. Like anybody who has eyes and looks at average your average guy will see that you know, sitting around talking about their feelings in some sort of encounter group isn't going to work. You know, and if you just let the poor guy just let them have sheds. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm being. I, I don't. I don't know if Hungarian men have garden sheds, but this is an English. There's an English tradition. A garden sheds. Yeah, garden sheds. Yeah. Um, would you, or would you, you know, this sort of patronising idea of the man cave, which I do think is very condescending. But you, you know, to, to my eye, I'm, the, the, here's an example which I which I I've given a couple of times. I, I run a lot um, out in the countryside. I take the dog with me. I remember I, I was running through a big a big field not, not far from where I live a little while ago. And I noticed that there are men apparently standing completely isolated and sort of, you know, there's 10 or 15 of them at different points all over the field. I thought, what the hell are they doing? Um, and I realized that they're metal detectorists. Yeah, and these are, these are guys, they, they, they come with their metal detectors and they sort of go over the farm, looking, looking for just detritus or, you know, digging things up and looking for treasure, you know, in a field because, like, because that's what they like doing. And, and there are people who are really into this, men, really, who are really into this. And it, and it struck me as, I, you know, they're sort of, they're dotted around, you know, there must be sort of, you know, five minute walk between each of them. And it suddenly hit me as I was walking, as I was running through the field, these men are socializing. <laughs> and they're just doing it on a frequency which is completely inaccessible to me. Um, and they would, and, and, and I'm willing to bet that by at the end of their metal detectorizing session, they'd all go back to their cars, which are parked in a neighboring field, and they'd grunt at each other in passing, um, and they and they they'd agree to convene again for another detectorizing. And they've had a great, and, and they've afternoon. had a great time. And I'm like, I've I, I've no idea what's going on here, but these guys are socializing. And when I say let men be, uh, I mean, can we just back off a bit and stop trying to manage how men socialize with one another, because I'm never going to understand how it works. But can we just accept that that's a thing? You well, know, isn't, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that, that this is, you're pointing to the, the lie that men and women are, are basically interchangeable. I, it's not true. A, one of the things that uh, a lot of my guy friends and I laugh about is an old Far Side cartoon. There was a, a, an American syndicated cartoon in the 80s and 90s called The Far Side. It's very funny. And uh, in one of the, the, the best known panels, it's a man and a woman in a car driving out on a date. And the little thought bubble over the woman is, does he like me? I don't know. What did he just look at me? What is he thinking? And on and on and on. She's obsessing. 
And the thought bubble over the man's head is, I think my favorite flavor is vanilla. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. Every man I know talks about my wife. She just won't believe me when I tell her, that, no, I'm, I'm not worried about this sort of thing. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. That, I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot more to the to the discussion I've made in the book. I mean, what one of so so the, I mean the the fact that men and women have different soci, different patterns of sociality, which seems just observably true to me. Like there there are a number of things that follow from that, and there are a number of things that follow for women or for feminists really from accepting that in principle. Um, and one thing that follows from that is that if we want good men, um, if if, if and, and if, I, if, as I propose, the, the best way forward for young women is to find a good man to marry, then we need, we need good men. And if we want good men, we need to stand back and let, let men form one another. Um, because it's, it, it's, it's as observably true to me that, that men don't listen to women when it comes to learning how to be a man, as it is, as it is true that men and women socialize differently. Like, if, if, you, look at, if, like, if you look at young men, it, it don't, you, they, they could be lectured till the cows come home by female teachers or their mothers or their aunts or whatever about, about the, the right way to be and behave. They won't listen. They just they, they will not hear it. And then Jordan Peterson pops up on YouTube and they're like, oh yeah, I'll tidy my room. You know, having been nagged by their mother for the last 15 years, they're like, hey, you know, yeah, he's right. Um, so if, if, we want, if, if we want there to be any good men to marry, we have to back off and we have to let men form one another and we have to let older men form younger men. And, and we also have to accept that there are some, that there are some spaces where we might resent um, being excluded, but that if we want there to be any, any, if we want there to be any spaces for male socialization, we might have to accept that sometimes that's the price. And uh, if we, and, and, and more importantly, if we want so any support at all from men in defending women's single sex spaces, for example, in sports or prisons or any of the any any of the areas which are now under attack by gender ideologists who believe that men can literally become women and that they should then be allowed to use women's toilets or changing rooms. If we want any support from men um, in in protecting those spaces from incursion by trans identified males, then we're going to have to let men have their spaces back. Because one of the most common arguments that I see on the internet from men, you know, again, when, when women say, well, you know, we, we must protect women's sport, we must protect women's prisons, we must protect single sex space, and they're like, well, fuck you. You know, you, you <laughs> took away all our spaces. You know, you made your bed, ladies, now you can lie in it. Now, pardon, pardon my language, but, the, but this is a very common sentiment. And, the, and when, you, when you look at the, the asymmetrical uh, co-edification, for example, of the Boy Scouts, and you know, all the way from the Boy Scouts through, you know, the pretty much every uh, every other all-male space that there is. You see, it's kind of true, and I, and I mean, I can I can see why. You know, at the at the top end of the scale, there, there would be women com women complaining with some justice about um, about professional opportunities being gatekept in all-male spaces, you know, unfairly, and that they would object to that. But there are a whole load of other all-male spaces much further down the socioeconomic food chain where nobody was gatekeeping power and nobody was gatekeeping influence and nobody was gatekeeping anything. It was just guys communing on whatever that, whatever, whatever that frequency is that I don't understand. And, th and though all those spaces have been dismantled as a, as a byproduct of the ambitious women at the top of the hierarchy wanting wanting equal opportunities and an equal shot at smashing the glass ceiling. And to me, that's a gross injustice. And it's, and it's also disastrous for women because it, it means that there's a, there's a type of masculine formation for which there are now almost no opportunities. Mm. And, it's, and it's a disaster for men because they're lonely. And yeah. that's and, and, and they turn to porn. Yeah, uh, they or they, they turn to porn, or they end up, you know, brewing, you know, you know marinating in in crazy ideologies in on, on the internet yeah. or, or whatever. But 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 they're lonely, and to me, that's just it, every, everybody should care about that. That's, well, that's uh, just last terrible. last point, and then we'll go to questions. You also suggest that we need to rewild <laughs> sex. Now, it to, seems sorry. to me that um, you can't walk out your front door without seeing the most incredibly arcane and bizarre and even perverted forms of sexuality on, on full display. What would it mean to rewild sex when all, all kinds of sex is right there now, right in your face, right on your, on your kid's phone? So this is, but I've borrowed the metaphor of rewilding from ecology. Um, and if, if, I, if I explain what rewilding is, it will, be, it will be easier to explain what I mean by rewilding sex. So rewilding is the, is the idea that um, 
well, a, a, a popular concept in rewilding is that if you reintroduce apex predators back into a natural ecosystem where they've been lost, then a great many other things can come in, will, will come back into balance, which are, which are currently not working properly. That ecosystems are complex, that you know, a great many, they have a great many different species and different plant species and different systems working in concert with one another. And a lot of them don't work unless the, the apex predator is there. And the example I've given in the book is, there's a, a fabulous video, if you can look it up, it's on YouTube, about how when they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone National Park, um, some, so a river changed course. And, and this happened through a complex set of interactions where the wolves were eating more of a certain kind of animal and therefore that was eating, that was, that was destroying some, some of the plant life in a different way. And in the, as a consequence of that, so the river started to change, the riverbed started to change course. Um, and in the course, and, and a great many other positive changes came downstream of that. Um, and the, so, so, so where, where I draw a parallel between this and rewilding sex is by saying that if we want to, to rebalance our sexual ecology, which is the, 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 the absolute core of, what it, of the relation between men and women and the, the absolute core of how men and women live together is our sexual relation to one another, then we have to reintroduce the equivalent of the apex predator, which is the meaningful possibility of pregnancy. When that means if we want to rebalance in women's interests as well as in men's interests the, the, our sexual relations, uh, that means a feminist case against the pill. Um, lots of, the, the, you know, there were sharp intakes of breath from a lot of my feminist friends when I made this case. Although, funnily enough, it was actually mostly the boomers who seemed appalled. The Younger boomers. Ones, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean, they, they, I guess they all came of age, you know, in the, in the sexual revolution. Um, younger women, I, I was expecting a lot, more, a lot more pushback from younger women, and actually I, I haven't really received it. And, and, and then I realized that the reason for this is that it's pretty normal if you're in your early 20s as an averagely liberal young woman now to have been put on the pill just routinely by your doctor at the age of 14 and maybe to have spent 10 years on this radically mind-altering substance. You know, mostly just so you could have loveless sex with guys who don't particularly care about you and that you probably, when you probably won't come. And so after 10 years of this, they've come off the pill and they've just had a complete personality transplant. All of the things that they thought were chronic mental health conditions have abruptly disappeared. And they're like, what did you just do to me? You know, what was that? And, and there, are great many, there are great many young women in their, in their early to mid-20s who I speak to who, who, feel like, who feel like the pill did a real number on them. In and that who may way. in no way be a, a social conservative. Right. And you know, many of them, are, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not social conservatives. They're not particularly Christian. They're not even, but but they've, they've, they've been given this substance as a completely routine matter of course, and they're, and they're appalled at what was done to them. And they're, and, and they, and they're not even particularly into the kind of sexual, the, the kind of sexual culture which, is, which, which, which we have derived as a consequence of being able to de-risk sex in this way. And you know, and who long for partnership, and they long for intimacy, and they, and they, you know, and they want to have kids, and 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 are, and, and are forswearing. There's a phenomenally a, a powerful movement for natural family planning, which is you know, even among women who who have, who, who who wouldn't know Catholic social teaching if it bit them on the bit them on the ankle. Well, we might might need to explain briefly natural family planning natural for family Hungarian planning. audience. This, <laughs> no, NFP is something okay. that uh, in the U.S. at least. It's something that people who are faithful Catholics follow. It is a way of uh, controlling your fertility without using artificial contraception, mm -hmm. birth control. It's approved by the Catholic Church, and a lot of faithful Catholics use it. Not just faithful Catholics, but women of all kinds who uh, want to control their fertility without jacking their bodies up with hormones. Yeah, yeah. And, and this, is, this is becoming increasingly popular, even with averagely secular young women who just want to feel more attuned to their bodies and who, who are no longer interested in, yeah, jacking themselves up on artificial hormones, you know, which, which leave them fat. I mean, I, I was on the pill for three or four years in my late teens. It just made me fat and took away my fat and crazy. I was really crazy and took away my libido. And I mean, what, what's the point of, what's the point of de-risking sex when you just don't even want to have it? And, yeah. and, and, and also you're miserable. Yeah. That, that, that sucks. <laughs> Well, uh, let's turn to the audience. I know there's got to be a lot of people note. here with questions. Yes, so um, earlier on in the, uh, in the talk, you talked about, uh, you know, the difference between like post-liberalism post and um, uh, reactionary feminism, etc. And to me, when I look at post-liberalism, it seems to me it's people coming from both the left and the right who are kind of disillusioned with the uh, kind of like 
the liberalism of the left, the social liberalism of the right, and the social liberal and the economic liberalism of the right, and they want something which is different, and they tend to kind of, and it almost is a kind of nostalgia for what happened in, you know, for Christianity, I think. And what I'm seeing now, I mean, you know, I'm a practicing uh, Christian, but in, in, in spite of um, Mr. Orban's rhetoric about uh, Hungary being a Christian country and everything like that, uh, Christianity is just as much on the way in here as it is everywhere else in Europe. I mean, I go to church, everyone in my church is old, okay? And this is not, not atypical, I don't think. So do you think the kind of world which you're kind of imagining is possible in a, such a post-Christian era in a totally secular uh, world? That's a great question. Is, is what you propose possible in a post-Christian culture? My Catholic critics argue that no. Um, to which I would say, you may be right, but we have to try. I don't know is the short answer. Um, I feel, I, I, I probably, I share your pessimism about institutional Christianity. I don't, I don't think Christianity is toast altogether. I, I just think institutional Christianity is toast. You know, Christianity has faced periods in the wilderness before. And I think, I think as, a, as a faith, it's, it's a long way from dead and I, I, I wouldn't be too quick to pronounce it um, moribund. Um, but as a, as a set of political institutions, it's, it's very much in trouble. Um, however, um, yeah, I, 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 would, I wouldn't pronounce the death of Christianity. I also, I also suspect that going forward, um, a lot of people are going to experiment with a lot of different things in order to try and figure out how we get out of the mess that we're now in. Um, and that what we're, what we're likely to see is a sort of fragmentation into subcultures. I mean, the, at the end of the, I mean, our, our larger public culture, um, with very few exceptions, is structurally antinatalist. I mean, you know, the, the, the government here is, is making, making astonishingly strenuous efforts to push back against that. And even so, it's not moving the needle so much. You know, there are, and a, a fundamental, I mean, I think it's a spiritual problem. It's also a material and economic problem. You know, the, the, the larger material forces are, are structurally antinatalist. And whatever culture survives this sort of auto-genocide that we're currently putting ourselves through in, in the developed world is going to be whoever it is figures out how to, how, to, how to get out of that, how to unplug from the Skinner machine and how to unplug from... About how to unplug from all of those pressures, and I don't know what that subculture is going to look like. It might be it might be an esoteric Christian subculture of which there are many. Rod has written books about how to create option. them, right? Yeah, the, but buy, buy Rod's book. It's an it's an instruction manual for creating your own Christian it's in subculture. It's Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. And there, are, and, and there are plenty of others who are who are experimenting in different ways. So the, I don't know if it's possible. I don't, I don't know if it's possible out with. Uh, with a Christian culture, but uh, I, see, I see Christian subcultures forming everywhere, and in any case, I think we have to try whether or not we're people of faith. I think as somebody else said, I think it might be, might be Mark Stein or somebody, that the future belongs to those who show up. So whoever, yes. whichever cultures are producing families and are raising families according to their own, uh, their own beliefs will in the future have the advantage of the cultures which are kind of antinatalist, which, which are not producing children. I and mean, that's just obvious that that's going to happen, I would say. Yeah. Okay, we need uh, another question. Who, someone else. Over here. Thank you. I particularly resonate with your point of uh, leaving, was it letting man be man or leaving men be and such? And I find that one of the more disturbing trends among others of uh, modern social life is the prevalence of uh, serial killer media documentaries and podcasts and such. And they draw a huge uh, audience of women, unfortunately, I suppose. Um, and as a fact is that many women who watch these kinds of media, they began to draw patterns between what costs, what would make a potential serial killer, and that being, say, unconventional hobbies or behaviors that may not be harmful. So my, po my question is, to what extent can this randomized, so to speak, pathologization of, of unconventional male behavior be curbed? The 
to what extent can the pathologization of uh, unconventional male behavior unconventional male behavior what Un that can can I suppose he's asking if uh, can can uh, women be convinced to open their minds to more diverse uh, set of behaviors among men you know and not say think oh this guy's a weirdo therefore I'm not he's not worth considering as a partner so 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 essentially if you, you you see a bunch of guys who like rebuilding model railways and you just assume that they're probably serial killers because they're, they're rebuilding model railways and obsessed with something which isn't talking about the feelings. Uh, did, do I have you? Do I have, okay. Yeah, essentially. Um, can, I, can I persuade all of the women in the world not to, not to, not to, look, at, not to look at men's innocent obsession with model railways in that way? No. Um, I mean, I, I can, I can only, I've, I can only jump up and down saying, like, please, please, just leave. Like, most guys are quite nice. Can you leave? Can you just leave them alone a bit. Um, the, the, I don't know. I, I mean, I think the the internet is a huge fact. Is a is a is a crazy accelerant of this kind of toxicity um, because it do, it it has well, one of the effects that it has is of. Allowing allowing people to pursue their obsessions, but also whilst also remaining very atomized. I mean, I see I see sort of garden shed hobbyists. Like to me, that's a sort of life giving and life affirming thing, um, to the extent that it allows men, people, particularly men, to socialize without having to sit around talking about their feelings, but in real life. I mean, it seems it seems clear to me that you know, men men benefit perhaps much more than women from doing stuff together. And if there's if there's sexed if the, if there's a sexed piece of advice that I would give to men, it's get the hell offline. You know, the internet feminizes everybody because they because it forecloses physical activity whilst incentivizing endless talking, um, which is a, a very feminized mode of interaction. I mean, of course, there are count, countless other things that women do together other than sit around talking, but it's much easier to to interact in a feminized way, in a feminine way on the internet. Um, than it is to interact in a masculine way on the internet. Because so, so much of male socializing doesn't, I mean, it, like the detectorists in the field, it doesn't, need, doesn't really necessarily involve very many words. It involves doing stuff together. So I think if there's, if there's something that would really help, it would be men getting the hell offline and doing, doing stuff in, in, in real life. Well, it had better happen soon because I, I was reading just the other day about uh, artificial intelligence. AI has created this service where men, well, anybody, but it's mostly men, uh, create a, a, an AI girlfriend, AI partner, which you can mold completely to your own expectations. And it turns out that, like, there's one, one service called Replica that has had 20 million downloads. 20 million people, are their primary intimate relationship is with a robot. And uh, again, it's not all men, but it's mostly men. And there was this one fellow interviewed by uh, uh, the Evening Standard, I think, in England, who said, 41-year-old guy, he said, I've had a couple of failed tries at relationships, but now it's perfect, and I've asked Haley, my AI girlfriend, to marry me. Well, this is bonkers, right? But it, it, I, I felt sorry for the guy because so many young men, I mean, I'm the father of young men, and I know that the risk is everything for them. If they try to take a, uh, if they take a chance to uh, to uh, uh, intervene with a woman, to appeal to a woman, and they say the wrong thing, they can be denounced as some sort of bigot or a creep or a predator, or in some way, if they, they don't fit this sort of weird perfect ideal of perfection that women have gotten from the internet and from social media, you know, they get shot down and they're made to feel shame. So. You know, it's it's not just about guys going down the internet rabbit hole. It's uh, in some ways they do it to protect themselves from the consequences of being rejected or pathologized by women. Is that fair? Well, I've been off the market since 2012. So, and I met my husband before online dating was really a thing. So I have very limited personal experience of what dating is like. I hear from younger friends that it's kind of a mess out there. Um, I, I, I couldn't speak to your son's experience. If that's, if that's how it feels to him, then my, my heart goes out to him. Well, he, I mean, he's, he, the oldest son has a, has a girlfriend, thank God. But, um, but this is a sort of thing that I'm having to 
look at myself and I think about all three of my children who are of the age to date and I find partners, it's crazy. And the guys, I, 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 I have particular fears for my daughter that she won't be able to find a guy who hasn't had his brain fried by porn. But my sons are just, they're having to walk across a minefield because there is zero uh, tolerance for making a mistake. Yeah, the in the internet is a crazy accelerant for all of this stuff because it, in in a sense, it collapses it collapses the space available for intimacy. Um, I mean, this is this is probably too much to get into at this point. But I've, I, well, a concept I've been playing with a lot recently is digital modesty. You know, the digital, I, modesty. Di digital modesty. I think we we've inherited from really really from the counterculture in the 1960s this uh, this culture of transparency, and we've transposed that into the internet era, and we've come into it with this up until now fairly unquestioned belief that life will become better if we make everything openly available on the internet, if we, we, we if we're radically transparent in every possible way on the internet. I've come to think that that's a mistake and that we should be very much more intentional about availing ourselves on the internet. And I don't just mean those of us who have slightly heretical opinions that need to be careful about what we say in public, although that's part of it, but, but to, be, to be very intentional about what we reveal of ourselves in our, in our digital persona, and to be much more intentional about cultivating spaces in which intimacy remains possible. And I mean, this is something I think about concretely in terms of protecting my, f I mean, I have a public life on the internet. I have 40 something Twitter, 40 something thousand Twitter followers. I think very carefully before I post anything personal, any like, you know, even down to, am I showing too much of my home in a photograph I've just taken of one of my chickens? Like, you know, is it appropriate to share photos of my dog? I think my dog is okay. My dog has, a, my dog appeared in a spectator podcast with me because I had to bring her to London. So like my dog is, I'll take, I'll share photos of my dog. I will not publish photos. Of, I will not, no selfies, no pictures of my family, no pictures of my husband, no pictures of my home, no information about any of them. Um, and to me, that's a basic discipline and it's a basic duty which I owe to my family um, to, to shield the relationships which don't just belong to me and that I don't have a, a right to mine for content. Uh, and I think unless we're able to cultivate very intentionally a, 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 a kind of modesty and a, 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 a deliberate refusal to turn ourselves into internet spectacle, then there is no possibility for the kind of intimacy that you're talking about. And I think really the, the scenario that you're talking about is one where both the young man and the young woman who come to a possible romantic encounter are doing so with an imagined audience of thousands in their heads on the internet the whole time. And there's always this little voice in the back of everybody's head saying, what are people, you know, if, if this goes on Instagram, how is it going to play? Right, And right, like, right. how are you supposed to form any kind of an intimate, int intimate relationship in that context when, you've put, when you feel like you're being watched by thousands the whole time? It's just not possible. And unless there's a, some kind of, some, unless, and this is going to be, this is on the kids to figure out because I'm too old to do anything other than like offer some commentary. Um, but it's going to be on the kids to figure out how you, re, how you recreate spaces of intimacy, you know, against that sort of eye of Sauron, that kind of red, that, that yeah. pressure, constant pressure to kind of self-expose online all the time. Did you ever read that novel by Milan Kundera, The Unbearable Lightness mm -hmm. of Being? There's a great um, uh, argument in the book between two characters. One, Franz, comes from uh, Western Europe. He believes that you can only live in truth if you're completely transparent. You live in a glass house. His girlfriend, Sabina, who is from uh, Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. she says, no, that's absolutely wrong. You can only live in truth if you have a strong wall of privacy, because only then, without the eyes of others on you, are your actions authentic? And I think that I think about that a lot when I think about what the internet has done to us. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I dare say that those those in Hungary who remember who remember living under communism would take a different view to the all all seeing eye. <laughs> I, I imagine you would have a different relationship to the idea of total transparency and total surveillance if that was your if if that was your within living memory. But certainly within in in the Anglo context, there's no there's no collective history of you know living under a sort of totalitarian surveillance regime. And and so we're kind of self surveilling. You know we we're, we're, we're inviting we're inviting pretty much that level of kind of total mm -hmm. intrusive that tyrannical total transparency into our own lives. And and in the process and, and I think. A, a, an economy of total transparency in that way is one where intimacy is based is, is total alienation 
where intimacy is just not possible because there's no the, there's no way I can have a relationship which is just for you mm -hmm. if, if everything has to be transparent all the time. And there's no way I can have an inner life which is just for me. And unless I can have an inner life which is just for me, I can't have a relationship which is just for my, for my family, for my loved ones. And, and to me, that feels like a profound, a profound theft and a profound right. impoverishment of, of what's, what's possible. And, and, and I struggle to see how, how men and women can exist in relation to one another without, without finding ways to recreate those, those intimate right. places. Another question. Do we have a young woman with a question? I'd love to hear how, our, how the young women are reacting to what Mary said tonight. Hello. Um, so back to the marriage and let man be a man. Um, I come from the U.S. and I grew up in a very um, man-hating environment. Um, in my uni at the start of my freshman or first year, in my first semester, the professor right away told us that to never get married, the white man is the enemy of us, and that our children will turn into our pets. And so just based on like, we shouldn't use digital uh, or social media, we shouldn't use Tinder and everything, how can we like as a community of the 40 or 50 people that are here change that impact because I have a lot of female friends who never had a relationship, never had dates. And then I also know a lot of guys who never had girlfriends and never been on dates. So how can we uh, change that mindset? Like I guess using social media to um, broadcast like Jordan Peterson, but like, how can we do that on like a micro and a macro scale? Because I guess for my generation, it's like, like you guys said, it is a big doomish or gloomish uh, future, but it'd be nice to like see the hope and the beauty of the future of marriage and having kids. So what advice would both of you or anyone in the audience would give to Generation Z? Thank you. I feel like one of the missing pieces is aunties. And um, by aunties, I, I, let, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, at some, some time ago, in one of the jobs that I, I sucked at, um, one of my colleagues was a young guy, in his late 20s, um, British Asian, um, who was in the process of being carted around various eligible young women by, by his extended family in the hopes that he, he and one of them would hit it off and they would have a kind of modern version of an arranged marriage. Um, and in, in the, he described how pretty much anywhere he went within the sort of the, the geography that he was visiting, like the aunties would know what he was doing. And it took me a while to figure out what he meant by the aunties. And that the aunties for him wasn't just his, literally his mother's and mother and father's siblings. Um, it was an entire gossip network of older women um, who felt entitled at any point to interfere in his life and the life of other young people of, of, of a similar age and who always knew everything that was going on and who were and, and, and who, who basically ran the social fabric for his for his community in that part of, of northwest London um, and I, I feel like when it comes to family formation the missing piece is aunties um, somehow somehow the the modern developed world older older women essentially older married women have given up, have either abandoned or had taken away from us. I'm not really sure which one. Um, this, this sense of entitlement in interfering in younger people's love lives. Like, and, I, and I feel like actually it's on us. It's on, it's on women like me who are married. Like you, you, can't, you can't have men like setting, setting you up on a date. That's just weird and creepy. Um, but like the only people who can do that safely and affectionately are, are older married women really. And maybe old, older, married, older unmarried women, but like you, you can't have skin in the game. You've got to be, you've got to be on the shelf. Um, but, but you know, if you, <laughs> if you're in that position, I really believe like older women should be interfering in your love life. Um, but maybe you could ask them. Maybe, maybe you could ask the old, older women. You know, you know, can you help? You know, do you know anybody? You know, can you talk to your friends and see if they know anybody? And it, it's a start. And at least then you could start rebuilding the, those, those that thicker social network which allows people to come together in a slightly more in a way which is slightly more held by their communities and not not in this sort of howling internet wasteland i don't know it, it might it's maybe it's a crazy idea but it's also an old like it's a it, it's lindy it's it's trad <laughs> it's but, worth a go so yeah let's see, see, see like who are your aunties who are your community's aunties yeah can you ask them to help 
They might even be really pleased and just felt like they didn't have a right to interfere. It's, yeah, it's worth because a Because a, a lot of people at my, my age, we see our kids struggling to find partners and we, we want to help, but we also feel like, hey, should, shouldn't we? Would they resent us for it? But maybe we should be a little more forward. Maybe they would actually like it. Um, I would answer your question a little more philosophically. Um, I, a story I've told before from this stage uh, is a true story that happened here in Budapest a few years ago. I was here doing uh, research for a book, and uh, my, my interpreter, who's translating when I went to do interviews, um, was a, a young woman in her early 30s, married with one kid and one on the way. And as we were on the tram, she said that, you know, I really struggle uh, talking to my friends, even my fellow Catholic friends, she was a Catholic, about marriage and family life. Because as soon as I say, oh, my husband and I have been arguing lately, or my little boy has been really putting a lot of stress on my marriage by his behavior, something like that, my friends automatically jump in and say, oh, get a divorce or put your kid in daycare. You've got to be happy. She said, I try to tell them, wait a minute, I am happy. I love being a mom. I love being a wife. But a happy life is not a life without uh, friction, without trouble, without suffering. And um, I looked at her and said, it sounds like that you're fighting for your right to be unhappy. She said, that's it. Where did you get that? I pulled my phone out, went to chapter 17 of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, the other great uh, dystopian novel of the 20th century in English, the first one being 1980, uh, 1984. And what Huxley talks about is a totalitarian society that is built around the terror everybody has in the society of being unhappy. And by being unhappy, they mean, um, you know, to, to anything from real physical suffering to simple anxiety. They believe a, a utopia is a society where they don't have to be uh, unhappy about anything. So this is a culture of total atomization total sexualization, and total entertainment, and total use of drugs to keep people happy. And uh, it is a totalitarian, inhuman society. So what my friend was uh, and I were talking about on the tram that day in Budapest is we have created a society now in the West that's a lot like that, or trending towards that, where people can't tolerate suffering, even the most minute form of suffering, just anxiety, can't tolerate it for a second. So uh, Mary writes in her book about this woman named Honor Jones, an American um, journalist who wrote uh, an essay in the Atlantic magazine, a prominent magazine, about why she divorced her husband, even though he was a decent enough guy, but she felt that she couldn't really be herself married to him. It was the most trivial reason to throw away a marriage, a good marriage. But um, I'm hearing from my friends in America who are around my age, I'm in my mid-50s, that this is happening more and more. I have a friend in Alabama whose wife was part of a group of six women, and every single one of these middle-aged women divorced their husbands. The husbands had been faithful. They were good providers. They weren't alcoholics or drug abusers. They were just bored. The women were bored. And let, this is the sort of thing we would hear about when I was a kid growing up in the 70s that men would do. And now it's flipped. That's not progress. Um, if you have anything to say about that, speak now uh, because we're, we've come to the end of our time together. Yeah, I've, actually, I've been, I've been running a little, a little series on my Substack newsletter. Um, and I'm try, trying to do my bit to kind of push back against exactly that narrative, which says that, you know, if you're... If, if your lifelong partnership is not is no longer delivering on the self actualization front then or on any front any front for any trivial reason whatsoever then you have a right to to press the detonate button um, and and that and that there is nothing between um, absolute happy ever after romantic perfection and ending severing the relationship there is there's no space in between and actually the reality is that most of marriage happens in the space between and you know there are probably there are probably borderline cases where for 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 whatever reason for complex usually very painful reasons uh, it's the, the marriage doesn't survive but there's a great many more rela relationships where you know you can have a rough patch that can go on for years literally years and this is particularly prevalent when children are young because it, it's tough particularly when you don't have extended family around or you know money is tight or whatever you know it can be it can be really 
really hard, and sometimes you can re you can wind each other up for literally years at a time. Um, is that a reason to, to press the detonate button? I would say more often than not, it isn't. And yet we have this culture which says that you should, because. And, one, and, and there's, a, there's a structural reason why this is difficult, why it's difficult to find counter arguments. And, it, and it's, it's simply because it's very, very hard to talk about a relationship which is still, still thriving. You know, it's very, very hard to talk about the painful part, parts of a relationship which is still, which is still in existence. Like, I can't, you know, I can't talk about my marriage because it doesn't just belong to me. It's, it's absolutely off limits. And that means that structurally, it's much easier to write I why I divorced my husband articles. It's, mu it's, it's quite easy to write those because I don't care. Well, I don't care what my ex thinks, like stuff him. You know, <laughs> if he feels like I've overshared, then I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care. But you know, I can't, I can't do that to my husband for, for reasons which ought to be obvious. Um, and so there's a real dearth of marriage survival stories. And so I, I asked my readers, you know, do you have a story of a rough patch that you're willing to share? And I got so many. I was absolutely deluged with stories of, you know, women who, you know, they, they were mostly women. I think it's mostly women who read my newsletter, but men and women writing to tell me about, you know, infidelities that they'd survived or financial crises or, you know, radical changes in circumstances or one of them had a, but, you know, any, any one of the things which could cause a conflict or a difficulty or a challenge in a marriage. And, and these, some of them are incredibly moving stories. And I've been, I've been collating and uh, I publish them at intervals, you know, just as a way of pushing back and saying, no, actually, like, like most of marriage happens somewhere in the space between um, happy ever after and you know you need to leave now. You know a, a huge amount like that. That's the warp and the weft of life. And and we have to find ways of telling those stories and we have to find ways of making space for that fact and for the fact that some of it won't be happy and that that's also true and that and that sometimes you really do have to take the long view and that's also true and that if you do take the long view more often than not things things come right again over time but you really do have to be patient sometimes just grit your teeth um, and somehow and maybe also the missing aunties uh, yeah, the, i mean this is this is the kind of stuff that that the aunties would probably would have communicated informally and to the and, and partly the reason that people don't understand this anymore is because we've lost that extended family and we've lost that oral transmission of of some of these you know slightly more pragmatic truths about what what every what family life looks like you know we don't see so many people on a day-to-day -day basis we're not around children you know we don't meet so many older women or you know who can who can tell us who can tell us a bit more pragmatically what what life actually looks like and instead we just get this nonsense you know we, we get articles in the atlantic saying you know it's fine to divorce your husband because you're bored um, yeah i i had coffee yesterday in paris with a french friend who had just buried his grandmother and he said you know when i look back on on the life she had my grandfather was difficult to live with for a period in their life, and for um, he was unfaithful to her, and it really caused her a lot of pain. And she decided at one point, I've got to leave him. And she told my mom, who was a little girl, that she was going to leave father. And uh, the little girl started crying and said, Mommy, don't. Please don't. And the grandmother decided, okay, I'll stay for the child. Well, they had five very difficult years, but the husband finally, the grandfather finally repented of his, of his wicked ways, and they went on to have like 40 more beautiful years. My, my friend said just to watch how much my grandparents loved each other and how my grandmother cared for my grandfather through his long death. And he said it was such a beautiful thing. But if my grandmother had not looked at my mom as a little girl and heard mommy don't, and decided I'll put the little girl's happiness over, over my own come what may. And there was no beating, it was just infidelity, which is bad enough, but there was no, nobody's life was at risk. If the mom hadn't done that, what kind of horror would have happened to that family? And that's, that's just a good illustration of, of what you were saying. Before we say goodbye to you, what's your substack? It's a reactionaryfeminist.substack. <laughs> reactionaryfeminist.substack.com, Reactionary yeah. you should subscribe to it. And, um, and read Mary at unheard.com, and uh, where else? Uh, that's pretty much, well, all, all over the place, but those are the two main ones, Substack and, and Unheard, where I have a weekly column. Very good. Mary Harrington, thank you for coming to Budapest and being with us tonight. Let's thank give her a round of applause. Me.